So the Beacon Readers and this movement towards synthetic phonics lasted till about 1930 or so. And right now I'm actually taking a class in the intellectual history of the United States, trying to figure out if there's some influence or intellectual history um, to our um, reading history and our reading instruction history. And I'm in the middle of the class, so I haven't quite figured it out yet, but um, kind of before World War I, there were some serious intellectual movements and really thinking about democracy, um, small d, um, thinking about um, how we we're gonna get our people more engaged. And Dewey was a big part of that. Um, there are a bunch of other people, I'm not gonna name them all because I haven't really figured this out. <laughs> but a lot of people blame Dewey for progressive education. But um, so far I have not found anyone that said stop um, teaching phonics from that set. Um, you know, they all went through World War I, got very disenchanted, as you might imagine. Um, the, national, the nativism that hit America was pretty crazy after World War I. And um, intellectual pursuits were kind of, you know, really on the back burner and frustrated with America. People went to, um, even Dewey went to Japan, I think, or China. And a lot of people went to France. Hemingway was in France. You know, a lot of people went to Paris. Um, but they started coming back right before uh, the depression and thinking about this democracy again. And it wasn't until this linguist, Arthur Gates, um, really started looking at reading. And it was kind of in this era of um, trying to create democracy again and thinking about this, that he really wanted pe um, kids to learn more experientially um, and thinking about language. And I'm just trying to figure out if he was really the one that said phonics are terrible, don't teach them phonics anymore. But that's how people took it for sure. And really started with the whole word and looking at teaching reading um, with whole words. And that lasted for a long time. They came up with books like Dick and Jane. They were very predictable and repetitive. And they thought you'd um, build your memory bank of words um, by, um, just figuring out what words looked like, not really how to sound them out. And so those books lasted for a long time. Um, meanwhile, there were some people kind of thinking about dyslexia and wondering about it. And they were also, um, Arthur Gates was at Teachers College, um, but so was Samuel Orton and Anna Gillingham. Um, Samuel Orton was a uh, neuroscientist and Anna Gillingham was an educational psychologist. And so they really started looking at the brain and they had to look at dead people's brains because we didn't have fMRI, we didn't have MRIs or fMRIs at the time. But they were trying to look um, and figure out how brains worked and how the language worked. And they actually figured out stuff about the frontal part of your brain and the back part of your brain and how they connected it from these, um, you know, autopsy studies of brains. It was quite amazing. And Anna Gillingham really set to work on dividing our language up into synthetic codes. Um, so she was the one that really figured out synthetic phonics and figured it out. And she developed a program and she gave it to a woman named Diana King who implemented it at Sidwell Friends in Washington, DC. Um, and I got to meet Diana King when she was in her nineties and she was amazing. Wow. Yeah, my son went to her summer camp um and um so she did, did a little lecture and we got to talk to her she implemented what anna gillingham figured out at sidwell friends in washington dc in the early 1940s and she did this with other um struggling readers um, they weren't identified as dyslexic but they were really struggling readers and so many of them probably were dyslexic trying to learn on whole word it didn't take very many weeks for these kids to be reading and writing better than their peers in the whole word classrooms. So it was just amazing breakthroughs. But um, this whole democracy, social issue stuff was still really strong and that kids should learn more experientially was really strong. And you know, it just didn't take any root. Um, There's a lot more studying going on though, based on this work. And um, there were papers put out, one of them's learning to read the great debate. Um, 
the great the book why Johnny can't read um, came out. There were all sorts of things trying to promote the synthetic phonics, um, and they were doing pretty well. But then the psycholinguists came back, and they refined the whole word with whole language. Um, and they thought they'd add um, not just memorizing whole words, but looking at pictures, <laughs> um, looking at syntax, meaning, um, thinking about um, all the words in context of all the other words. Um, so, right, you know, not long after that, um, in the early 80s, why Johnny still can't read <laughs> was published. Um, and these people were really, you know, pushing this. Um, in 1986, the simple view of reading what um, came out, which is um, the alphabetic principles, the phonemic awareness, that's hearing all the sounds in a word. Like how many sounds are there in the word, or how many syllables are there in the word silence? Two. Right. How many phonemes? Seven. Oh, sorry, six. Yep. So most people don't think about those six phonemes. Yeah. But kids learning to read that and learning to spell that word need to. It's not a, you know, two syllables doesn't make sense when it's six phonemes. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know your, um, the rules of all the syllables, mm -hmm. you come across that word, you're going to have to sound it out by the phonemes, not by the syllables. Yeah. Um, once you learn all your rules about syllables, you can start using syllable things. But at first, you learn the sounds. Um, so the simple view of reading is phonemic awareness, phonological awareness to make decoding happen. Mm -hmm. and then there are some sight words that, you know, just don't have a code, um, got to learn them. Or there's so few other words with that code, like said and again, have the AI for that S sound. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's pretty rare. So that might be a sight word early on. Mm -hmm. um, later on, you'll figure out some of the morphology that it got there. But at first, it's in so many books. Johnny said, Catherine said, Debbie said, you know, it's a pretty common word that you're just going to have to learn. So it's the alphabetic principles, decoding, and some sight words. Together, um, times language concepts, which is syntax, um, use of language, you know, all those things at the top of the reading row. Um, you know, comprehension things, background knowledge, all that together. So they're a product. Um, language comprehension plus um, word work, word recognition um, equals reading comprehension. So if one is zero, the product is zero. You need mm -hmm. both. And then the graphic representation of that is Scarborough's reading room. Yeah. And we know if one strand is weak, all the strands are weak. You can't have a rope with a weak strand. And mm -hmm. especially if a, you know, three or four strands are all weak, that rope's not going to hold. So Scarborough's reading rope is kind of emanates from the simple view of reading. Then in, I think 1990, California really saw a huge decline in reading. You know, it was the result of a couple generations of this whole language. And um, their congressman called for a national reading panel. They looked at 100,000 studies of reading and they came up with a report and there's a cover memo for that report and it's recommending um, the structured literacy, the simple view of reading, Scarborough's rope, you need phonics. But somehow they weren't strong enough. They didn't, it just didn't get implemented. And what we got um, here was this kind of they call it balanced literacy, but we all know it's very unbalanced literacy. Mm -hmm. um, and the phonics programs and the language comprehension programs don't meet. And sometimes the phonics programs don't even come when they're not even part of the school because no one's trained on them. There's um, generations of teachers that were just never taught how to teach reading um, and or taught something really watered down maybe taught by a quote experienced teacher, a new teacher gets it from the experienced teacher. This stuff just isn't even taught in our teaching colleges. You can't get it pre-service. 
Um, a few states have now started requiring it pre-service, but it's not in every, it's definitely not in every teaching college. Well, and it's catching those but teachers. Now, we're already trained, right? So just because exactly. we're they have pre-service teachers doesn't mean that we're help, right. helping current teachers. And, yeah, and there's people, there are um, professors that really get it and they teach classes and, and the students get it and they land in a school where the principal has a balanced literacy program and they can't even implement what they learn. There's people that go for their Wilson or OG training and come back and aren't allowed to use it. So it's a real problem. Um, but now things, um, there's some uplifting things now. Um, our functional MRIs have proved that Orton and Gillingham were right. It's pretty amazing that their autopsy work lines up with functional MRIs that are happening now. Um, there's a lot more work into genetics and neurobiology and all sorts of other stuff now. So people are doing a lot of work. But I got to sit in two of the teacher colleges readers and writers project workshops last week and this week. And Lucy Cockins has adopted or has given up queuing. She's adopting decodable readers. Um, she's taken some baby steps into the science of reading and it was really exciting. Let's just go backtrack and talk about who Lucy Cockins is and what she, she's she been uh, using and advocating in her programs, just for those who haven't sure. heard her name or know so what. The, yeah, Lucy Calkins, uh has a program, a professional development program at Teachers College at Columbia University. It's really the hallmark of balanced literacy, which is not very balanced. Um, she's in about 20, her program is in about 20% of schools in the country here in, in um, the US. I don't know what the percentage is in in Canada. Yeah, I'm not sure the percentage, but it's quite yeah. prevalent. And it's not just North America, it's worldwide. That her, her it program. is. Um, and there's other people that have are have put out programs just like hers. Mm -hmm. um, Qantas and Pinnell are very similar in how they're looking at reading. Um, there's Australians and Canadians that have published very similar things. Um, but Lucy Coppins is one of the leaders in this thing and people really follow what she's doing. Um, so it was really exciting this week but to see that she said, oh, we're missing something in our programs. She's always said that they they're, um, wanted um, the schools that they're in to use a phonics program along with her program, but there was no way for her to control that or control the quality of the phonics program. So a couple of years ago, she put out a phonics program, but she didn't do a whole lot of research before she got it out there. Um, and it's not the best, um, but she's really seeing that and seeing how a good phonics program needs to line up with your decodable readers, right? You can't have them not lined up and it needs to line up with your assessment system. So they're even looking at how their running records can be a better assessment system. You know, right. counting, right. running right. records. Right. Yeah, just give it a little explanation. Assess, yeah, running records for the most part helps teachers count errors, not categorize them. Um, it's a lot of work for a teacher to categorize the errors. But if you're categorizing them built on what you have just taught, it's much easier, mm -hmm. right? We just taught this rule. Oh, this kid didn't get it. We're going to have to go back with this kid. Or, wow, we taught this. We taught it that last week. She had it last week, but she lost it. We're going to have to remaster that. You know, it'll be a lot easier if things are aligned. Yeah, um, you know, right now trying to use a running record on a class of 28 kids that are all sorts of different levels because they're trying to figure it out themselves. It's really hard. For sure. So, you know, but I'm happy to report that I saw some real baby steps towards the science of reading. And, you know, I think if people continue pushing, we keep up with the journalism. Um, you know, we go beyond dyslexia awareness month and do this 12 months a year. Yes. <laughs> I think we can get somewhere. Definitely.